first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to give these lectures, well, to the scientific <laughs> council who invited me. And it's a great pleasure. And then I just discovered you have a beautiful new building. It's the first time that I'm here. It's wonderful with the garden. And I'm speaking in Amphitheatre Yokoz, and I have Jean-Christophe looking at me from the right corner. So it's especially a pleasure. So Jean-Christophe was a very inspirational and important fi figure, I guess, for many of us, and for me in particular also. So I think I'm very inspired by this Amphitheatre. OK, so I don't know. So actually, can we have, so who is a student in this room? Can, uh, there are a few students. OK, I was told there were 20 students who signed up. I don't see 20, but I see some of you, so welcome. And I see also some colleagues and some people I know. So I was asked to prepare the first lecture to be quite uh, elementary, and colloquium style. So today, it's a bit uh, different than the rest of the classes. I wanted to start uh, gently. and. Uh, give you a bit of overview and introduction. And um, so I'm going to talk about parabolic dynamics. I'll tell you in a second what parabolic dynamics is. But first of all, just, uh, OK, it's uh, one of the three areas of dynamical systems, as I will try to explain, hyperbolic, elliptic, and parabolic. But while hyperbolic and elliptic are much more established and kind of have a longer history, parabolic dynamics is still kind of a, uh, it's not new, but the examples have been studied since the 70s, but it's still kind of a field, the less understood uh, part of dynamics maybe. And we will try to kind of, I wanted to uh, give you kind of an idea of what is happening also in recent research. And it's also somehow the umbrella under which I like to think of my own work. So I think, mm, all of my work is in parabolic dynamics, so I'll try also to give you a biased introduction because I present also some of my own results with collaborators and also some classical and basic results. Okay, so, but I want to start. So who in this room works on dynamical systems? Okay, not everybody. Okay, not everybody, so let me start for a bit. So I don't know how big should I write? Can you see? Uh, can you see from the top? Is it good from the top? Good? OK. So as I said, today I will not give too many definitions, but it will be 12 hours course. So we will have time to see things from basics to ad advanced, also mixed. So, so let me just say for now, a dynamical system could be iteration of a map, or could be iteration of a um, one parameter family of maps, so a flow. So let me write phi r for the collection of phi t family parameterized by r that you should think of time. And also here uh, is axon space. And this is discrete dynamical system. And this is a continuous time dynamical system. And I will not say much more else. But um, I want to consider either iterates of these maps. So Tn is just T composed with T and times, apply to x. Or um, trajectories of this one parameter family. So uh, and you, you consider this, this is the orbit of a point. So this could be parameterized by L or parameterized by Z if the system is invertible. And I'm writing already too big. So this is what we call trajectory of a point, trajectory or orbit. And uh, here also same. This is also called the trajectory. And the name orbit or actually comes from celestial mechanics, because Poincaré was the first to study dynamical systems in the context of celestial mechanics. And again, so many of the systems present uh, even though they are fully deterministic, so you can say exactly what is uh, how your point is evolving. This is a fully deterministic law of evolution, and you should think of the dynamical system as telling what is happening to your point as time moves in discrete or continuous intervals. They often uh, they often display chaotic features, 
and we will see a lot of type of chaotic features. And it gives right to what uh, people call deterministic chaos. So you can have a fully deterministic system, which in some um, average or statistical way display chaotic features. OK, and uh, any, I'm really right to pick. So any um, definitions of chaos, there are plenty. And we will see ergodic theoretical properties in the, during the course. But uh, let me say that there is one feature of chaotic systems which is common to all definitions of chaos and which is also commonly associated to chaos. And I'm sure you heard about the butterfly effect. Uh, and mathematically, we call it sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions, STIC. And uh, OK, let's just give a mathematical definition. So let's assume now that uh, our space has a, is a metric space, so we have a distance. And then sensitive dependence. Uh, so the map, say, for this. Definitions are similar for maps of flow. Uh, let me write it for the map. Has sensitive dependence on initial conditions. If there exists a constant, sensitivity constant, such that. So the idea of the butterfly is that if I take two points nearby, I can never be sure. I cannot predict the evolution of that. It's hard to predict because there can be uh, macroscopic huge differences if I change a bit the initial point. So uh, the way formally to say it is that uh, whatever, whatever initial condition I take, whatever point in space I take, maybe not every point nearby, but at least arbitrary close. So for every epsilon, I can find another condition y closer than epsilon. So maybe it's nice to have colors. Uh, maybe it's enough to have yellow. Yellow is usually good. So I can find maybe not every point, but at least some point arbitrarily close, uh, such that uh, there exists a time when I consider the orbits of these two points, and I start applying my map t to the end, and I start applying it to maybe at the beginning they travel very close together. But as I keep going, at some point, at some point, I find a time n such that the distance between uh, these two points is k apart. So there exists an n such that the distance between tn of x and tn of y is greater than kappa. So this is the idea of the butterfly effect. So if I change a bit the initial condition, I can be unlucky and pick such a bad y whose long time evolution gives me a very different outcome than what I expected. OK, so this idea of sensitive dependence is key in this deterministic chaos uh, point of view. Not every system has it, but we will see plenty of examples that have sensitive dependence. And uh, um, let me just say, so dynamical systems, there is a very rough, very rough uh, division, uh, very rough uh, mm, uh, yeah, division, differentiation. Um, okay. There are three main uh, type of dynamical systems. And uh, so let's go from the least chaotic. So let me write elliptic dynamical system. So in elliptic dynamical systems, there is no sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Or maybe, maybe there is some, or there is uh, in case, or, or if any, 
uh, super polynomial. Already is low, even logarithmic. Maybe. Ah, sorry. Uh, okay, so I should have asked uh, before starting giving the answer. So somehow I can ask myself uh, if there is a sensitive dependence, how fast is this? Uh, uh, so if there is sensitive dependence, I can find nearby points whose forward orbits diverge. And I can ask myself how fast this divergence happens. So in the next two classes, uh, there will be sensitive dependence. But uh, uh, the speed, uh, it's an informal definition. This is not a mathematical definition. But I will write hyperbolic dynamical systems. So here they have sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And this fast, what does fast mean? It means that nearby points that, uh, whose orbits diverge, diverge exponentially. Exponential. Uh, and I will write infinitesimal. Uh, I'm writing out of space. Can you still see the smaller part, or is it too small? Is it still OK? OK. OK. So OK, the space is finite. Maybe it's compact, so I cannot just grow exponentially far. But I'm saying if I start since I can start expo very, very close, I'm just saying that initially I see exponentially growing uh, the, my distance between these two. Yeah. So, okay, exponential makes sense only on smaller scales. When I, when I reach a kappa, I don't care anymore. And if I'm in a bounded space, uh, that's it. Okay, so this again, it's not a formal definition. It's a, but uh, these are the fastest uh, chaotic systems. And I uh, will give you examples in a second. And in between no divergence and exponential divergence lies uh, the realm of parabolic dynamical systems. So they're kind of intermediate between elliptic and hyperbolic in the sense that they do display sensitive dependence, but the sensitive dependence is somehow slow. And by slow, I mean, again, we start from an infinitesimal scale, and we find orbits that by sensitive dependence uh, start diverging. But somehow, this is uh, sub-exponential. So it could be uh, polynomial, typically. Polynomial or sub-polynomial. So polynomial. Actually, I don't know of any good example with which is super polynomial, but okay. So the examples I have in mind are polynomial or super polynomial. And maybe I'll make a comment. Uh, let's see, I think it's have to put it up. So let's try if this one. Yes. And the comment, if you, I don't want to define entropy, and it's not a concept I want to define in this course, but if you know entropy, Entropy is a measure of how chaotic is a system. And actually, maybe I'll put it, uh, yeah, maybe we'll go here. A remark. So it could be metric entropy or topological entropy, whatever concept. So elliptic and parabolic both have entropy zero. So we are in the world of entropy zero. And instead, hyperbolic has positive entropy. And actually, some people would argue that parabolic systems are not chaotic, because if you take as a definition uh, positive entropy, they don't fit. But nevertheless, I'll try to convince you in this course that they display a lot of features of chaotic systems just on a slower time scale. And uh, uh, OK. And uh, what else did I want to say? 
I want to give you examples of all systems to start with. But I wanted to say also that somehow these uh, are two things, two comments about this division uh, I actually have. So first of all, these names I think are very unfortunate because elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic have different meaning in different parts of mathematics. So if you come from PDE, you know about elliptic, parabolic, PDE. If you come from complex dynamics, you call elliptic, parabolic. Have I don't, don't try to build, I mean, there is some vague analogy or connection, but it's not really, you should think this as a local definition in dynamics, and don't try to compare it. Actually, sometimes I get PD people who ask me, oh, but does it have to do with parabolic PD? No, 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 let's not discuss. It's just a division in dynamics. And I think elliptic and hyperbolic dynamics have much more of a history, in some sense, as a independent fields of research while parabolic dynamics is kind of new, but I think it's the person who maybe contributed the most to also uh, giving dignity to parabolic dynamics as an independent area of study is actually Katok. And so I don't know if you people know Katok Hasselblad wrote, uh, I happen to have it because I brought it with me, a handbook of dynamical systems. It's a famous book in dynamics, a great reference in general. And uh, for example, in this book, uh, Katak and Hasselblad push this idea that there are these three classes of dynamical systems and that parabolic dynamics has a dignity as an independent research area. Okay, so now I want to uh, give examples. And I want to give some examples also from the other two areas, elliptic and hyperbolic, and then uh, even though we will not talk much about them, we will briefly meet hyperbolic systems as a renormalization of some parabolic systems. But I just want to try to place some dynamics. And some people maybe know dynamics, some people don't. And again, it's an introductory class. I will not give definitions of all of these systems. I will define the ones that we will work with in the next lectures. OK, so for elliptic. So let's start with elliptic. So again, I want, want, want to do maybe a pictorial view. So the first example maybe much studied is uh, the theory of circle diffeomorphisms. So these are maps from the circle to the circle. And uh, there, this is a map. I want to give you for each class a map, a flow, so a discrete and a continuous, and a billiard. I'll tell you what the billiard is. And uh, in parallel, it actually, it's not E is not for example, E is for elliptic, elliptic one, elliptic two. And uh, let me give you a flow. This is an example of linear flows on the torus. So I'm going to take T2. The torus are 2 mod C2, and I'm thinking it of the unit square with opposite sides identified. This is a surface of genus 1. And uh, you can look at uh, a smooth flow. And let me give you in the picture. For example, the linear flow. So I'm going to just draw lines in a, some direction, parallel lines. And this would be just uh, uh, trajectories of my flow are just uh, uh, Vt is just uh, uh, motion at unit speed. You can write equations, but it's not worth it at unit speed along uh, lines parallel to some parallel lines, but lines in direction theta. But it's a module of the quotient, so you, uh, you, come, you use the gluings of the sides when you exit from one side, you come back. So this is uh, some kind of trajectories on the, on the torus, or you can take some uh, smooth area preserving Ah, this is the last. Oh, no, this also goes up. Okay, I have one more. 
Okay, and maybe let's skip for the last board. And uh, okay, so here clearly we see that there is no sensitive dependence. So if I take two points nearby, because I'm traveling with unit speed on parallel lines, they will always stay. It's an isometry. So this is clearly, uh, they will travel together and stay at the same distance. So they are uh, isometric. So there is no sensitive dependence. But this is also the case when you have um, instead of preserving. OK, and so these two examples are connected because uh, circle diffuse, you can see them as a discretization as of the linear flow or of some flow, some smooth flow on um, the torus. And somehow these two examples were the starting point of dynamical systems with the work of Poincaré. So Poincaré was interested in celestial mechanics and in stability for the solar system, but he took uh, as a toy model, uh, linear flows, or the flows, sorry, not linear, but flows on the torus and their Poincaré maps, the circle diffuse, and try to, okay. And, uh, and somehow, uh, okay, maybe I'll draw one more example. And the last example is from the world of billiards. So what is a billiard? So I'm going to draw a convex domain. And uh, what is called the billiard flow. So here I start with the point and the direction. And you just move uh, on a straight line until you hit uh, the boundary of your table. So you should think of this convex domain as a billiard table. Actually, you can build billiard tables in elliptical tables. Someone may actually construct a real billiard, but this is an idealized uh, billiard. So every time you travel on a straight line and every time you hit uh, the boundary, you draw the tangent and you reflect your trajectory so that it makes equal angles before and after. So now I got really one which is almost vertical, but OK, let's say that this is not really vertical. So every time you, yeah, actually, I draw it too complicated trajectory. Maybe it was better if I could draw one which is more flat, like this. OK. Yeah, that's better. OK. And uh, so all of uh, these three uh, classes of examples uh, lie in the world of elliptic dynamics. And uh, somehow, from the point of view of dynamics, so maybe I write some keywords in elliptic. Maybe this is a bad idea. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll go here. Keywords in the elliptical words. So in this type of examples, you have, uh, um, uh, first of all, uh, usually there are many uh, periodic orbits, many orbits which are closed. For example, in this type of billiards, you can find many periodic orbits. And you can also have trapping regions sometimes, or caustics, which are curves, which kind of, uh, OK, we're not defined. And uh, another thing is also the real of Hamiltonian dynamics. And a question that people often ask in this type of elliptic world is about perturbation. So if you try to, or stability of perturbation. So if you have many closed orbits or some kind of region which is foliated by closed orbits, and you perturb the system, will this perturb, uh, perturb system still have closed orbits? And this is the realm of uh, KAM, perturbative. Uh, theory. So this is just to place it. So this is one. OK, so we'll abandon this uh, word. And let's go to number two, hyperbolic. Hyperbolic dynamical systems. 
And again, I think maybe the most famous map, which is hyperbolic. It's again a map of the torus. It's a map of T2. And it's the cut map. So this is an example of what is called uh, anosov diffeomorphism. But this is a very anosov linear analog. So what is the cut map? You just take the matrix one, two, one, one, one and take a point in the torus. I write it as a vector. And uh, the image is just obtained by multiplying by this matrix, the vector, and taking the result modulo 1, so that you bring it back to uh, the torus. And if you see how this map acts, so first of all, it's called the cut map, because actually there's a famous book by Arnold, where apparently you can find this picture. So he drew the map, uh, a little picture of face. Actually, I cannot do a cat. It's supposed to be a cat face. And this poor cat, if you apply the map T, after application of the map T, so the square is first uh, uh, linearly deformed by the matrix. It's kind of stretched. And then, because of the mod 1, you bring it back to the unit square. And uh, you can do some kind of cut and paste of pieces. So your poor square cat is first stretched. And then, um, yeah, I don't know. So <laughs> the face of your cat got, got quite mixed up, it got stretched and uh, reassembled. So, and uh, in this map, you can see it's a very, very basic example, but you can see so that uh, A has uh, a positive eigenvector, and the other eigenvector is 1 over the determinant is 1, so the other eigenvector is less than 1. So these are eigenvectors. You can write them down. And uh, uh, let's take the, sorry, eigenvalues. Eigenvalues. One, one greater than one, one less than one. And A, let's take the eigenvectors. Let's call them the I, the I eigenvectors. And so if you take two points, X and Y, which are aligned in the direction of the stable, uh, of the unstable, of the expanding. So if this is V1, it's the direction of the positive greater than 1 eigenvalue. And if you take x, which is y plus actually y, actually x and y is a bad choice because I call them x and y here. So if you take x2, y2, which is x1, y1, plus v1, uh, or sometimes epsilon, then you can see that these two points uh, that are aligned will actually expand exponentially fast. So orbit, maybe that, maybe. orbits diverge exponentially. OK, so this is an example of exponential divergence. And this is indeed the paradigm. It's a linear, and it's a system on the torus. But somehow, it's the paradigm of, of a hyperbolic system. And the formal definition is that you can decompose the tangent space into some expanding and some contracting directions, like here, the expanding and contracting direction. And uh, you have some exponential expansion. Uh, or exponential contraction in the past. OK. And uh, I'm already out of space, but maybe I'll try to fit here. So the second example comes from geometry. And uh, so again, so if I take 
the upper half space, and I want to go to a geodesic flow. So this has a hyperbolic metric. And uh, I'm going to draw geodesics for the hyperbolic metric. So, so reality check. Who is familiar in this room with geodesic flow, hyperbolic geometry? Hyperbolic geometry? Okay, not everybody. <laughs> okay, so my plan tomorrow, I want to talk to the horocycle flow, which is the companion of the hyperbolic. So I will give some basic definition tomorrow about geodesic and horocycle and start discussing the horocycle flow. But uh, okay, so today is just a picture. So okay, on the upper half face, you have hyperbolic metric and you can talk of hyperbolic geodesic. They look like uh, semicircles orthogonal to. Okay, we'll discuss a bit tomorrow. Not much, because, uh, but uh, minimum. And um, okay, so these are geodesics in the hyperbolic metric. But this is an infinite space. But you can look at the quotient by a group of isometries of the hyperbolic metric. So gamma is a Fuchsian group. And when you get the quotient, again, we will maybe discuss a bit tomorrow, you can find the fundamental domain for this quotient. It will be some kind of hyperbolic polygon. And on the quotient, after identification, it's actually a surface, which this is a uh, hyperbolic metric, so hyperbolic surface. And I'm in trouble because I have to put down a board, and I don't have space to put it down. So maybe I do it because I, I wrote in this board, which I cannot move up. I'll finish this example on this board, and then I will change board for the next. Uh, OK, so this is an example from geometry. And uh, you can look at hyperbolic geodesics on this uh, surface with the hyperbolic metric. And uh, on the, so if you consider as a space, yeah, I called M my surface. Maybe let's call it S. So if you remember, it's a surface. So I get a surface with a hyperbolic uh, geometry, and on the unit tangent bundle of the surface, I can look <coughs> at what is called uh, uh, geodesic flow. I don't have, did I have the notation for flow? Yes, I wrote it R. From X to X is the geodesic flow. So this moves points along geodesic at unit speed. So unit speed along geodesic. And, and uh, OK, uh, again, I will define more tomorrow. But uh, uh, so this is actually one of the first examples uh, of a hyperbolic system, and it goes back to Hedlund and Morse, and uh, maybe beginning, yeah. Uh, so it's one of the oldest examples of hyperbolic systems, and also the most studied, and the most generalized. Also, so these are really the two. So and also, uh, like the cut map, and this example are the simplest hyperbolic model, but of course you can study plenty of generalizations. And uh, just to finish with one billiard, uh, I'll do uh, what's called the Sinai billiard. And I said I'll change board, but I'll do it next. So again, one example from the world of billiards. I take a rectangle or a square, whatever you like, and I place an obstacle, which is a circle, in the middle. So I'm going to play billiard like we did in the in the uh, convex domain before, but now my billiard table. So so it's a billiard flow in a square or rectangle 
with uh, a circular obstacle or convex, strictly convex obstacle, also called the scatterer. And so again, you play with your billiard ball. You shoot it in some direction. And when you hit the boundary or the scatterer, you reflect with the law of equal angles. Here, 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 and then so on. Okay, so this is also a model which appears in, if you want to study two hard balls in, in physics, and you, you can reduce the system of two hard balls bouncing with each other to the motion of the center of mass, and the center of mass lives in a phase space which has an obstacle. And the obstacle corresponds to the fact that two hard balls cannot touch each other. Okay, but so this system is not coming out of the blue, it has a physical motivation. Okay. But so the theory of hyperbolic billiards in somehow uh, starts with, uh, uh, well, Handel and Morse in geodesic flow were before, but Anosov and Sinai in the 70s um, develop really the foundation of hyperbolic dynamics. And <coughs> why this is, uh, can we see sensitive dependence? Here it's very nice to see because you see sensitive dependence very well. So if I take two points, uh, let's see if I can show it in my picture. Uh, yeah, if I take two points nearby, so when I hit the boundary, yeah. because the boundary is strictly convex, uh, if I hit it, okay, maybe you can maybe draw a better picture. Maybe let's try again. So you can have this point, but then you can have a pa even a parallel trajectory of a nearby point. Uh, the future evolution after one bounce, yeah, I feel like I didn't have a good picture. So <laughs> let me try on a piece. So this is one, and this is a parallel trajectory of a nearby point, but after, because of the convexity, somehow after hitting, the things are not parallel anymore, they start diverging. So there is a scattering, what is called a scattering, after hitting convex, strictly convex boundary, and this gives a sensitive dependence on initial condition in a very strong way. Okay, so an Ozov, Sinai, among others, in the 70s develop the, the background, the setting of hyperbolic dynamics. Okay. Okay, so now that we play, and the, somehow there is a, the hyperbolic, uh, uh, there is a lot of research on, uh, well, first it was non-uniformly hyperbolic, and then Partially hyperbolic dynamical systems are much studies nowadays are still a very active area of research, but a kind of, uh, if we stick to hyperbolic, there is a quite clear, uh, clear theory and universal properties. And a feature of hyperbolic systems is that they are open. So if you perturb a hyperbolic system, it will stay hyperbolic. So, this was a very vague introduction. And now, finally, we go to the examples of parabolic. And these are, uh, so we will encounter again, uh, and also linear maps, we will encounter, maybe also pseudo and also, but we will encounter these maps and we will encounter the geodesic flow because they will play a role in the study of parabolic dynamics as renormalization maps. We will see this concept coming. So it's good that we, elliptic, I will not do anything elliptic, but we just put, place it in context. I want to compare the parabolic examples where, with what we already have here. Okay, so T1, sorry, T1. Uh, no, which one is up? I'm confused. This is T2 then. 
Ah. So T2 goes up. Uh, T3 comes up too. Great. And the other one stays in the back. So we forget about it. And then we have T. Yeah. Good. Sorry, I have to erase hyperbolic. OK, so parabolic. So there is one, the single most studied example of parabolic system, and the only one which we really understand better than anybody, anything else, is the counterpart of this geodesic flow. And I think it will be the first type of, um, I will tell you more tomorrow, but uh, <coughs> OK, so parabolic. So we, I drew a picture before of geodesics, but the geodesics come uh, with the counterpart. There are auto cycles. So auto uh, cycle flow. So here the space is again the unit tangent bundle of a surface with the hyperbolic metric. So, so S is the quotient of the upper half plane. So we will see this tomorrow. And we will also give a more algebraic description. So there is a geometric and an algebraic point of view. But uh, so the horror cycle flow, the trajectories instead than this geodesics, they are, uh, uh, you can draw circles which are tangent to the real axis. These are called horror cycle. So these are circles tangent to the real axis. And uh, unit, you can put unit tangent vectors pointing outward or inward. And depends which one you consider. And the horror cycle flow takes, uh, takes the horror cycle flow, I will not let me draw a picture now, takes some vector, some point and some vector, and you have to find the circle uh, orthogonal to this and tangent to this point, and then it starts moving it. So it's in the unit tangent bundle. So moves along or cycles. And again, maybe if you know, you're bored. If you don't know, it's too fast, but we'll discuss tomorrow. <clears throat> but what I want to say that this uh, horror cycle flow is actually a uh, parabolic. And it's also the best understood. So it's been studied starting from uh, the 70s. Actually, starting, there's also Hedlund who did. But then somehow the chaotic property, the, so I can just put in some names, Dani, Fustenberg, in the case of compact surface, and then you can you have maybe Maybe it doesn't mean just right. Marcus and uh, Ratner, Marina Ratner. But uh, there are, of course, lots of generalization to uh, non-compact, infinite covers. I mean, non-constant negative curvature, whatever you want. So, but uh, the classical one is maybe the best understood. And I want to at least finish the examples, but. Uh, uh, OK, so we will see tomorrow that this flow also has an algebraic description. And together with this, there is a second example. So this flow will talk. And also the second class of flow is nil flows on nil manifolds. So I don't feel guilty if I don't tell you today uh, what they are. So I'll just tell you what is an nil manifold. So a nil manifold, now the space will be the quotient. So n will be a nil potent Lie group. And gamma would be a lattice. And again, we will define this. So we will see some. And uh, for example, n could be the Heisenberg group.
and this is just a space of uh, three by three diagonal matrices x y yeah. uh, matrices with one on the diagonal x y c here x y c in R. This is the Heisenberg group, and it's one of the basic examples of nilpotent groups. So, okay, so we take the quotient of, for example, the Heisenberg group, and you can take as a lattice, you can take the same with integer entries, and you get a compact manifold. And then you consider uh, one parameter. Uh, uh, one parameter flows, which are obtained by uh, left multiplication. Okay, we will see this. So this is a very algebraic example, and it has parabolic features, but we will discuss in which sense. And uh, okay, so so maybe an important remark is that both these example P one and P two are algebraic. Algebraic, so they have an interpretation. Yeah, oh. actually linear algebra almost. Uh, let's try to go up like this. Maybe it's faster. Yes, good. And maybe also pulling down is faster. Great. And ah, <laughs> I hit myself. Sorry, <laughs> not very good. So, <laughs> so nil flows uh, have also been because they are algebraic. Nil flows and horizontal flows. And more in general, I should have written some unipotent flows, which are the generalization of the horocycle flow, have been studied in the 70s already, or they are, they are again very well understood because sometimes we have lots of tools. We are in the world of algebraic uh, only groups, and we have also representation theory, and uh, uh, there are lots of tools to study them. <laughs> But they're somehow also because they're algebraic, they are easy to study, or easy not, but they are, there are more tools to study them. But there, I want to convince you. Uh, ah, I really hit myself. I want to convince you that uh, uh, they are actually special. And they are not, uh, in my, one of the plot lines of this course is that actually these algebraic examples are not good examples of parabolic dynamics because they are somehow too special. They have too much structure. And if you want to understand uh, parabolic dynamics, you need to go beyond these algebraic examples. And then I'll mention, yeah, maybe two more examples. P3, uh, parabolic tree. I want, this is my favorite example by far, and the one that I love the best. So you can take a surface, a smooth, uh, uh, compact, orientable, uh, uh, with a smooth area, area form, surface of higher genus. And it's important that now the genus is not one as we were in the elliptic world, but the genus now is higher. And we just consider a flow, which is smooth and area preserving. So, so by this I mean that if I have a set Sorry. So for every set on the surface, when I flow it, maybe it's deformed, but the area doesn't change. So the area with respect to this area form, oh, I will go back. So it's somehow incompressible or, uh, yeah. So these most area preserving flows are um, very nice examples of parabolic behavior. And I'll try to discuss them a bit. And uh, really, I should, OK, maybe I should know. Um, 
Um, okay, so these are not at all uh, algebraic, like the previous examples, and but they are they have some kind of um, difficulty feature. Uh, so, okay, we'll discuss them. So, but on the other hand, I I don't want it, I will come back to them and see some of the features of parabolic dynamics on them, but I don't want to focus on them. Actually, three years ago, I gave a, a series of lectures at Yashas just next door, where we will also be next week, and it was really focused on these uh, smooth area preserving flows. Actually, they are also equivalently, you can define them as locally Hamiltonian flows. And yeah, so I talked about ergodic problem mixing and some properties of this locally Hamiltonian flows and techniques to study them using interval exchange maps and the Yofantine condition. So this is something that I've studied a lot and I'm very attached to, but I gave a whole course on them last time. So what I plan to do is to, okay, I will focus on time changes of the previous two examples, which I still have to introduce. But uh, I will come back to them to say some of the latest developments. So maybe the last lectures, I will see also some features of these type of flows. OK. And uh, just to mention, they come with a counterpart. Oh, sorry, maybe we done let's separately. So in each time, we had at least, uh, uh, now we have only flows, actually. So we had a billiard in every class. So let me give you an example of billiard. So. If you take your billiard and instead in a circle, you put a rectangle as an obstacle. So this is also called the RFS billiard. And uh, here you see that this, uh, this has mixed features. So if I start the trajectory of some point, it's a billiard trajectory by now, we know how to plot it. But if I start nearby, I will actually stay nearby and parallel. But nevertheless, it's not fully uh, elliptic because if I now shoot close to a corner, maybe one trajectory hits the boundary, but the parallel trajectory goes straight. So you see, so there is sensitive dependence by initial conditions. It's only caused by discontinuities due to corners. Okay. So this, uh, this is the case that you have discontinuities due to corners. Also when you have in general uh, billiards in polygons. So billiards in polygons. So if you have a billiard in a polygonal table, okay, maybe I should draw the trajectory in a different color. Uh, okay. So it's similar. So trajectories travel parallel until they are maybe separated by corners. And the theory of billiards in rational polygons, rational means uh, uh, rational means uh, uh, that the angles are rational multiples of pi. So angles are pi pi over qi. This has been much, much studied, and it goes in parallel. I don't want to discuss now, but it goes in parallel with uh, uh, linear flows. I will just write the word linear flows on translation surfaces. So these are surfaces which instead of a negatively curved uh, metric have a flat metric with conical singularities. And uh, billiards can actually, billiards can be reduced to these linear flows. So this is an area which is very much uh, developed and 
I'll just write the name Tech Muller Dynamics. And maybe you heard, many of you heard about this. And there's, okay. So where does Tech Muller Dynamics and this billiards fit? So there is a kind of debate, and I have eternal fight with, uh, I don't know if you're ever gonna listen to it, Giovanni Forni. So this type of systems, polygon, billiards and polygons, and linear flows on translation surfaces, somehow they are considered elliptic with singularities. But I will write slash parabolic. So, okay, according to Giovanni Forni, for many years he went on saying, no, no, they are really elliptic with singularities because, you know, they're similar to the elliptic world where things travel together, but they have these corners or singular discontinuities which introduce a sensitive dependence. And there are reasons to, to, to say that. <coughs> but we will also see a posteriori that they share many features with parabolic systems. And uh, I, I'm, for the, I'm for the calling them parabolic still. But it's true that still, even if you call them parabolic, they're parabolic with singularities. And uh, uh, they are fit a bit. Uh, so the type of parabolic systems I want to focus on uh, in this course are more smooth parabolic systems. So better examples are the other three. So horocycle, need flows, and uh, smooth area preserving flows. And also we will see that these three examples that we will study more in the course uh, actually share, uh, this will be clearer when we go on, but I want to say one more thing before I erase it. So I said in hyperbolic dynamical system there is a subdivision, that again if you don't know it doesn't matter, but between uh, uniformly hyperbolic, partially hyperbolic, and uh, sorry, uniformly, non-uniformly hyperbolic, and partially par uh, hyperbolic. Maybe you know what this means, or maybe not. I want to drop this. So I think of the horocycle flow as somehow a uniformly parabolic. And again, I will try to explain what this means. We will see. An important feature in this system is shear, and shear will be uniform. So this is an example of a uniformly, for me, they're very different, these three examples, because they fit their prototype of these three subcategories of parabolic dynamics. So uniformly parabolic, and this little flows that we will discuss is not really parabolic, it's actually partially, para partially parabolic. And partially parabolic because it has directions that we will see, not tomorrow, but I don't know how we will do, but uh, we will get to need flows. And uh, they are related to skew products over rotations or over, so we also see the discrete. The, I, haven't, I don't have any map here, but we will meet maps when we discretize need flows. We will meet a prototype of a parabolic map, and it will be a skew product for the Heisenberg. Okay, maybe I can anticipate. They are related to maps of the form. So there is a skew product map, for example. The map of the x, y goes in x plus alpha, x plus y. Where alpha is irrational. Uh, alpha, is some, alpha is some rational and everything is in T2. So this would be related to a section of the Heisenberg need flow. Okay, so the fact is that uh, these uh, systems have directions where uh, they are isometric. And then you don't see, well, you see you are elliptic. So they have elliptic directions, and then they have other directions where you see parabolic features. So they are only partially parabolic. And we will perturb them soon and see that when you perturb them, you actually see really parabolic features. That's not, not enough. Okay, so we have uniformly parabolic, partially parabolic, and then we have uh, ah, this one. These flows on surfaces have a nice feature that they actually have some saddle points. 
So if you are a higher genus, a flaw on a higher genus surface is bound to have fixed points. And these fixed points, these are smooth flows, contrary to the, you can, you really have some smooth, but we'll see how they okay. But somehow, these uh, singularities introduce, uh, so maybe I will write, non uniformly parabolic. So they will display some feature of. Uh, some parabolic features like shear, but it will be not uniform like the horror cycle flow in negative curvature, constant negative curvature. Okay, so good. So uh, maybe I want to make, so, shall we do a break? Do you want to break or not? Shall we have a short break? Yeah? Or not? Or people prefer, I don't know, what is the custom? No, we go on. What is the custom here? I'm not a, very short. Huh? Maybe this will answer questions. Okay. But well, maybe we have should we have five minutes break or longer or yeah. I'm already going on for a long time. So let's minutes. have a five minutes break and let people think about questions. Oh yes. Um, I have a question to you. You gave us keywords for elliptic dynamical yes. systems. Yes. Could you give us keywords for hyperbolic? Yes, I can give you keywords, but I wanted to do it a bit later because elliptic, I'm going to drop them. So I can give you positive entropy, exponential decay of correlation, and uh, uh, yeah, so positive Yapun of exponents. So yeah, maybe those are good keywords. But I want to, so elliptic, I will drop. So elliptic, we will leave them and we'll not encounter them again. So yeah, what I wanted to do next is also at least say some. Uh, yeah, some chaotic properties that we want to study, indeed, as a decay of correlation, and kind of convince you that this parabolic system have uh, slow versions of the hyperbolic features. So, so the notion of this low sensitive dependence often translates in uh, chaotic properties, but uh, slower than in the hyperbolic world. So I want to go back to this comparison between uh, slow and fast and parabolic versus hyperbolic. And uh, yeah, I'm going a bit slower than I thought, but I wanted to also give some of the theorems that I want to discuss in the next weeks. I'll try to do that in the second part. So yeah, so far I just gave lots of examples without even defining them all, but just to kind of put, the, I just want to want to put pictures in the, the draw, yeah, examples from different fields, yeah. So now I want to, yeah, yeah, it will be a recurrent topic. So, we will see that but the keyword is shearing. So the, 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 we will see now in the system what, so what happens is shearing. So we will maybe say some. So and the shearing is somehow uniform in the, it's the, 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 the shearing direction and strength of the shear is uniform in the horror cycle flow. This we really will see because we will see mixing via shearing already tomorrow. And uh, Marcus argument, the geometric proof of mixing. And this is based on this uniform shearing. And in the neat flows, we will also see that uh, the shearing happens only in some directions, and we will perturb them to, so it's really partially. Uh, and in the, this type of examples, I don't know, we will see how much we'll discuss them at the end, but so yeah, we want to talk about shearing. So then the shearing create is created by the singularities and is non-uniform, so in some sense uh, it's, uh, I, I will go back to this, yes. But it's not a for, there's no formal definition. It's a, somehow a meta picture. I think we are so much, uh, there's no universal theory of parabolic systems. So we are, I'm trying to, but I think it's a, yeah, it's a good name. So naturally, yeah. So with, with Giovanni and Fonny, we were trying to kind of make sense of the parabolic world or the parabolic zoo sometimes. And, we were trying to say, okay, but we are looking at the examples which in some sense are very different. And in the hyperbolic world, each of them would be a different theory. So it's hard to compare. Okay, so we saw uh, lots and lots of examples, but I want to say something about the chaotic properties and the type of results we want to see. So first of all, uh, Okay, so we have three examples, but two are algebraic, and one is a bit special, actually four examples, and this is between elliptic and parabolic, elliptic with singularities, and 
they are all quite uh, special, so quite rigid. They are, each of them has been studied. But uh, if we want to make sense of parabolic dynamics, unfortunately, it's, uh, OK, so in the hyperbolic world, there is more stability. So we said perturbations are still parabolic. As in the hyperbolic, perturbations are still hyperbolic. The problem of the parabolic world is that somehow if you perturb something parabolic, you often get something hyperbolic. So they are not stable. They are not open. So, so more examples. And I'm also kind of claiming that uh, these examples are a bit uh, mischievous because they seem all to, as we, we will see, they all have different properties. And then you ask yourself, OK, what theory can I do if every example I study has a different properties. So, is, is it a zoo? So I'm kind of the paradigm or the philosophy. Uh, myself and others, Giovanni Forni, but also uh, Marius Lemanci, Kanigowski, many people have been trying to study more parabolic system and to try to make sense of common features and common techniques to try to have some kind of parabolic, there's no parabolic theory, but to try to find uniformizing features and structures. OK, so first of all, uh, so warning is that uh, somehow if I perturb uh, perturbations, I don't, know, I don't want to define which terms are, are often hyperbolic, hyperbolic. Actually, time permitting, it, it's hard to build parabolic perturbations. And actually, time permitting, I will talk about, uh, so Davide Ravotti, who was a PhD uh, student of mine in Bristol, now he's uh, uh, in Vienna. Uh, he has uh, a nice examples of uh, uh, parabolic family, of parabolic perturbations. Of a unipotent flow. Oh, well, I will, don't know what this, we don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. Unipotent flow in SL2R and SL3R. What about gamma? So he has some nice family of perturbation that he has been able to study and prove uh, ergodic results about. So if I have time, I can mention, uh, uh, talk about his work at some point. But in general, we don't have good techniques. So if anybody can come up with good classes of new parabolic flaws is good. But I want to talk about, I will talk about time changes. So what is a time change? A time change is kind of the easiest perturbation you can do to your flow. So let's say you have a new flow that I will call H tilde. Is a, and again, we will go back to more definitions, but it's a time change of H if essentially it's a flow with exactly the same orbit. So I'm traveling exactly in the same, uh, on the same trajectories, but I change the speed of motion. So I travel maybe faster, maybe slower. So let me just write uh, for every x and x in x, t in r, I have that h tilde of t of x is h of the same point. So I'm traveling on the same orbit, but I'm not, I'm at another time, at another point of the same orbit, h of t tau x where tau is some function from x cross r to r. And this will have to be a cycle to make it a flaw, but we'll go back to this. OK, so for now, I'm happy to just say this. So again, so remark is that I have the same trajectories. I'm not changing qualitatively, but different speed. So you will tell me, OK, that's such a stupid, this is a perturbation. So I'm changing my flow, but keeping the trajectories. 
And uh, so you can say a small time change if uh, uh, tau is small. Let me go back to this. So, and uh, this seems such innocent perturbation that you may think it may not affect a lot of the properties, but maybe a feature, feature of parabolic dynamics, and it's really a feature, a feature of parabolic dynamics is that uh, typical, and typical again, we will discuss later, so typical time change H tau H tilde R is not is it is genuinely new is a new flaw is a new parabolic flaw and by new I mean in particular for example it's a not isomorphic as a dynamical system let me not define also isomorphism, but it's not isomorphic to the old flow. So I really get a flow which is different than what I started with, not isomorphic. And many times, if you just time change, it has uh, new chaotic features. And often, I'll give you more examples. OK. And this uh, feature, uh, I don't know how much I will say about that, but it's related for people who are in the audience no more. It's related to um, obstructions to solve the cohomological equation. So if you try to find isomorphic time changes, you run into some kind of cohomological equation problem. And in parabolic dynamics, there are obstructions to solve. And, uh, a lot of this is also the work of Flaminio and Forni, Forni flows or Forni cycle flows, and uh, uh, okay, many others. So, okay, so that, uh, and uh, one of the philosophies that we've been pushing again, we started the program with Giovanni, but so many other people also have, have worked is that time changes are a good since we know so little about parabolic dynamics. Well, and since the time changes are not so difficult as perturbation, but still produce new examples. Let's start by studying time changes. So something that we will discuss exactly in this course is, uh, let's take these algebraic examples. Let's take horror cycle flow and mid flows. Uh, so program, I don't know if it's a program, but at least some, just few cases have been looked. So uh, study time changes, even smooth time changes, smooth time changes of known, ah, and maybe I should say this time change will preserve Smooth time change will keep the flow parabolic. I should have said that. So it will produce new parabolic flows, which are typically not isomorphic to the original one. So, so you can get uh, new parabolic flows in this way and uh, study time changes of known algebraic parabolic flow. And in this course, we will see, starting from tomorrow, we will see the horror cycle flow, but also time changes of horror cycle. And we will see next time changes of uh, near flows. Okay. And what is interesting is that as I said, we know those algebraic examples very well because we have a lot of techniques. Many are actually representation theory based. So they've been studied in the 70s using powerful techniques. But even when you do time changes, okay, actually, to be honest, the first results on time changes of the horror cycle flow are also very old and they, they go back to the 70s and to Marcus that we'll try to see tomorrow. 
and also Marina Ratner's work. His, many of her works are for time changes, but uh, discussion of mixing and spectrum or some finer chaotic properties, uh, it's something that we tried also to do recently. And uh, near flows, time changes, I think we were the first to look at uh, with uh, Giovanni and uh, also Arthur Avila and David Aravotti. Uh, recently joined this. And uh, somehow the idea is that you need to find, so maybe well, why this is interesting, so you need some, so, so, so let, me, let me just say, so warning is that uh, algebraic tools, in particular representation theory, and logic and mathematical tools break down because I'm not algebraic anymore, I'm not homogeneous, Maybe I should write uh, algebraic or hom not homogeneous. So both examples of uh, horror cycle and the flow are also homogeneous flows. So there are flows on uh, quotients of the groups and we are in the homogeneous dynamic setting. But when you to take a time change, you break homogeneity. So you need, you need uh, softer methods. You need proofs which are uh, more general in some sense, or don't require representation theory, for example. And uh, sometimes what I like that you, you, you uh, sometimes you can prove things with geometric mechanisms. So I want to discuss mixing of time changes of horror cycle, and I will give a proof of a horror cycle Mixing, which is not the algebraic proof, but it's the Marcus proof, which is softer, for example. Okay. Okay, so this is one point of time changes. And the other point that I want to make, and then I want to put chaotic properties, philosophic philosophy. And the other philosophy uh, why I like time changes is that, uh, okay, so we said this uh, parabolic examples that we have seem to be a bit of a zoo and have different features. Maybe I'll tell you some example of this. But the philosophy is that somehow when you look at time change, maybe you can find more generic properties. So maybe your example is strange or it's unusual because it's too homogeneous and too algebraic. So when you're looking at an example which is special, but if you perturb it by a time change, actually you see features which are more generic. So time changes, changes uh, have, have more typical, uh, it's very vague, typical uh, features. Because you somehow break the homogeneity. Okay. And now I want to move to um, ergodic properties. And maybe try to say some results. I don't know what to say, what do we want to prove. Okay, but so far we just talked about the systems. So what are these parabolic dynamical systems? And as I said, we we'll, on horror cycle and time changes and mean flows and their time changes will go back in the next lectures, more slowly, starting from some prerequisite and then going into some recent, some old and some recent results. But uh, with this point of view of time changes and soft geometric mechanisms and arguments. So what about the chaotic properties? So I want to do a bit of introduction today to that too. And okay, we said we want to study chaotic features. What are these features? What are these chaotic features? So now another uh, um, checkpoint. So you tell me only some of you know dynamical systems, some of you know hyperbolic geometry. And how about ergodic theory? Who has met ergodic theory? <laughs> well, I know some people do. Okay, not everybody. So I was trying to, I'm trying to give some background so that people can follow when they come from a different background, but then hopefully I'll try to tell some techniques or proofs. I, yeah, I don't think I'll give you full proofs, but I'll give you sketches of proofs of some many, some ideas from many of also the recent results 
Oh, this, yeah. Okay, good. So let me just say then a few things about uh, mm, some ergodic properties. And I lost my notes in the meanwhile. Uh, yeah, so first of all, we are going to do ergodic theory in this setting. So, so the setting ergodic theory is a part of dynamical system. So we want to study ergodic and spectral properties of this parabolic flow, ergo, ergodic, ergodic theory. Now just a few things to, to, for, for today. So, okay, so what is the setting? So we don't have only a space, but we have a measure, measure space. And a probability measure or finite, uh, finite measure. Otherwise, we do infinite ergodic theory. And we want to, and the setting is that the transformation T or the flow uh, phi are preserve, preserve uh, this mu. So, so mu is what is called an invariant measure. And again, we already talked about area preserving flows as an example. So let me just write one definition that in this case, if I have a set, which is uh, measurable in my sigma algebra, the measure of the inverse of A is equal to the measure of A. Uh, if I have an invertible system, I don't need to use the inverse. I can write the measure of T of A is equal to the measure of A. If it's not invertible, I need to use the inverse. Okay, but uh, for a flow, I just had before, uh, phi T of A is equal to the measure of A for every T in R because it's invertible. Okay, and uh, I'll just recall your two properties for today. Then we'll encounter more as we go. But let me recall you, so maybe just a definition. So the orbit or the trajectory of a point X is equidistributed uh, with respect to this measure mu. Equidistributed with respect. So, by the way, you can think of this measure as uh, equilibrium. So, it's like in physical point of view that you have a system which is somehow in equilibrium. Or if it's a fluid and this is a volume, you can think of it as an incompressible fluid. That's the setting. But, okay, equidistributed. If, so I can consider, uh, let's take, uh, as smooth for convenience observable. So I'll take a function from the space to R. And if I consider the integral, so let me give it a name, integral up to time t of f starting along the orbit. So what is this? I integrate from zero to t my function f along the orbit. So this is also called the ergodic integral. Or time average. Oh no, average no, because I didn't divide. So I integrate my function along the trajectory. And if my trajectory is equidistributed, I can expect that when I, uh, I can hope. Uh, so if it's equidistributed, yeah, no, if it's equidistributed, then I hope that when I integrate the function uh, and I divide it by big T, so I divide by big T, and then it's uh, equidistributed if this converges to the integral of f in the mu on space. So I can use my trajectory to compute uh, the integral of a function. And again, I made a mistake because I used the last board, which I cannot pull up. So if I pull it down, it will disappear. 
So I'll use this side for another while. Okay. So this is uh, like a, sorry, I'm going to have this very basic, but okay. So this is the beginning of ergodic theory. So uh, let's say this flow, but you can do it also for transformations, is uh, ergodic. Uh, if and only if mu almost every x uh, has uniformly distributed orbit. Uh, with respect to mu. It's ergodic with respect to mu. Invariant measure if it's if almost every point the equidistributes. And this is somehow uh, this notion of ergodic go back to Boltzmann. It's called the Boltzmann ergodic hypothesis. So somehow Boltzmann was interested in understanding when this, uh, when you renormalize, these are called time averages. And these are called space averages. So this is convergence of time averages to space averages. And this is a proven, it's a Birkhoff ergodic theorem. And you can take it as a, But actually, you can take uh, f in L2. Better to take it in L2 then. And then, so this is one, one object. And then, uh, if you want to go beyond this, the next uh, important notion, and this is the notion we'll discuss the most, maybe in this course, is uh, mixing. So ergodicity is kind of the starting point. And uh, so all the systems that we are going to look at will have a, a natural invariant measure, which is some kind of area or volume. So it's a nice, smooth invariant measure. And uh, will be ergodic. And uh, we'll be interested in going beyond ergodicity. And in particular, so mixing. So mixing is uh, some kind of form of asymptotic independence or uh, uh, the coupling, I'll just recall the definition. So, so let's say for a flow, so phi r is mixing. So when I take uh, two observables, so let's take them in L2, f and g. Then I can look at... Uh, can you see the bottom line? Is it okay also the bottom? It's not okay. So you can define the correlation. So maybe let me call it correlation fg at time t. So this is a space integral. So I take my function f and I compose it with the flow. And then I multiply times g, and I integrate in the try to the measure mu. So this is the correlation. And uh, it's mixing if this correlation as t grows. Uh, they kind of decorrelate. So actually, this goes to the product of the integrals of the two functions. And again, I cannot still pull up. So what am I supposed to do now? Are you writing or can I move the boards or you want to write a bit more? I can wait a second. Okay, so maybe I'll say before I write. So somehow, um, okay, so you want some more keywords from hyperbolic dynamics. So a keyword, so somehow the, the concept I want to bring in now is that uh, we defined parabolic and hyperbolic in terms of butterfly effect. We said the slow butterfly effect sub-exponential polynomial, typically, or sub-polynomial, or exponential butterfly effect. But this uh, butterfly effect, and we will see how in the parabolic case, through shearing in the parabolic case, will 
translate into speed uh, of uh, um, speed of convergence here and and here. So okay, so ergodicity and this uh, equidistribution of trajectories and uh, mixing the correlation of functions are two very fundamental properties in ergodic theory that we want to study and we can prove that the system has or not has them. So elliptic systems often also fail to be ergodic. There are some trapping regions or some closed orbits. So elliptic systems often die even here at the ergodic. But even when we have ergodicity in an elliptic system, you don't have mixing. So mixing is not, doesn't happen. And instead, in parabolic and hyperbolic world, we will have ergodicity and often mixing. So, oh, but somehow the difference between parabolic and hyperbolic will be the, uh, the speed. So maybe I will write down to a new point. Is that okay? For your right, you know, some people are like, so I don't want to move too fast the board. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, uh, again, I said it's an unfortunate name, hyperbolic and parabolic dynamics. So I kind of started giving like colloquial talks or um, more general talks in places. And I started not talking about parabolic dynamics, but talking about slow chaos, which I think it's a much nicer and appealing name because it's maybe closer to the mental image that we should have of parabolic dynamics. It's, Slowly chaotic phenomena. And actually, a journalist, actually, it's a mathematician who writes, wrote a paper in Italy about my work, and he titled it Corinna e Chaos Lento. So, Corinna and Slow Chaos. And I really like this Slow Chaos name. And after that, I started, I think, so, so Slow Chaos versus Fast Chaos. So in hyperbolic, in hyperbolic uh, systems, so again, it's not the only key feature, but one key feature is that many people, a key word is this exponential decay of correlation. Exponential decay of correlation. So by this, I mean, we take a, uh, yeah, below, uh, we take our correlations that we just defined here. Okay, so for convenience, it's nicer to take functions which have mean zero. So if the integral is zero, so if the integral of one of them actually is equal to zero, then this is going to zero. So this is called the decay of correlation. So the correlations decay to zero. And uh, you want to say that, uh, so you take uh, fg in L2 and integral of mu is equal to zero, then you can have the correlations of f and g, I'll use the other c, t, decay, go to zero as constant e to the alpha t for some constant alpha and exponent e to the minus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so decay, exponential decay of correlations. And also you have so some kind of. Huh? If f and g are smooth Ah, sorry, smooth. Yes. Let's write smooth. Oh, absolutely. No, sorry, sorry, of course. Yeah, I had smooth at the beginning because I wanted to get there. Yeah, for mixing, we can use L2, but if we want decay, you absolutely. So if you just take. Uh, yeah, if you don't assume regularity, there are counterexamples you can go as low as possible. Thank you for uh, spotting the typo. Okay, absolutely. And uh, uh, okay, so here you have exponential and also uh, fast equidistribution. I will not write here, okay? So these are somehow universal features of uh, hyperbolic dynamics. Instead, if you go to parabolic, somehow 
the expectation, but again, it's not a, it's an expectation or a hope, or it's not in every example, and it's not proven in many examples, but it's what we would like to expect for typical parabolic systems, and maybe we have to rule out some examples which are too algebraic or too, but somehow what we expect as features of the parabolic dynamics work is that if we have, when we have uh, mixing or when we have ergodicity, they are not fast, they are slow, and the slow means uh, polynomial or some polynomial. So the expectation is uh, polynomial or maybe even sub-polynomial. <laughs> Somehow this depends on also, okay, let's see, polynomial it depends on how uh, slow is the butterfly effect or it depends on how slow is uh, the shearing that we will encounter. Sub-polynomial uh, decay of correlation. for smooth observables. Smooth observable. And, uh, and that, okay, let me not write it. It means that here I decay like a polynomial, not as an exponential. And another feature of the parabolic world, which is uh, often, is what is called deviations polynomial. Let me write, let me write this polynomial deviations of ergodic averages so again so this is about uh, one is about mixing the other is about equidistribution so we can look at our ergodic integrals say for a smooth function and uh, uh, say again that the function has mean zero so when I take the average uh, on the, I go to zero. And uh, so, so say that f is mu, the integral of f in the mu is equal to zero, and uh, uh, the flow is ergodic. And uh, uh, so almost every point is equidistributed, equidistributed. And you take one of these points, which is equidistributed, then one over t, the integral of f x up to t. So this has to oh, actually let me not divide by t. So this one should be uh, small o of t, so it should go to zero when I divide by t. And you can ask how fast it goes to zero when I divide by t. And it goes to zero polynomially, and truly in many, so, okay. It could be soup, but in many examples, it could. So this uh, uh, is O, and I will write the power, T to the alpha, of T to the alpha, where alpha is in between zero and one. So I don't know, square root. So one over T, integral of t uh, goes to zero. So if I divide, so it will go to zero, but like, uh, yeah. So one over t to the one minus alpha. So constant one over t to one minus alpha, something like this. So it goes to zero polynomially. But, but this bound somehow, it's often optimal. So it's really of this order. It's not faster than this order. And this is a phenomenon which was discovered, so this uh, discovered, sorry, sorry, for horocycle cycle flow we will discuss. Uh, and it's actually also a feature of uh, flows of surfaces. And uh, for uh, linear flows on translation surfaces, it was uh, discovered by Zorich experimentally, and by there's Konsevich and Zorich conjecture, and then there's work of Forney on uh, and then there is a whole uh, deviation spectrum. You can try to study which exponents can appear here and asymptotic behavior and Buffetto work also. And okay, actually, I'm giving a talk on uh, this type of questions on 
deviations of ergodic averages and behavior of ergodic integrals for locally Hamiltonian flows on Friday at the semi dynamic seminar in Jussier. Uh, it's in Jussier. So this will be a more technical talk, but I will state some recent work, which is to front check on asymptotic expansion and power deviations for these integrals for locally Hamiltonian flows. So, OK, good. Uh, so, OK, so this is the, uh, so I wanted to make this point of slow chaos and fast chaos reflect themselves in not only the rather good, uh, chaotic properties, but some are fast, some are slow. Oh, sorry. Sorry again. Without killing my nail again. Maybe I should really use the. OK, this is good. OK. And that's the next. Good. Ah, this is a careful moment. I risk to do it again. OK, so what do I want to tell you now? So uh, maybe some prototype uh, results and uh, techniques that we will encounter. Uh, maybe one more thing. So uh, today I only defined ergodicity and mixing, but uh, so mixing we discuss a lot. So and, and other things that I would like to discuss later on is also there are some other features are spectral properties. So I don't want to define them now. So, time, so spectral properties, it's about, I take a function this time in L2. <coughs> Sorry, I write it here. And you can build an operator which sends L2 to L2. I forgot the sigma algebra, doesn't matter. And you can take the function and just compose it with the flow at time t and call this ut of f. So this is kind of evolution of the observables when you compose them with the flow. And this is a unitary operator when the system preserves the measure mu. And then you can ask about the spectrum. So again, I don't want to, I don't assume, so I will, if I have, to, I want to do something about spectral uh, properties, I will define true correlations. So you can study a lot of, uh, so okay, we'll discuss what I, introduce what I need, so I don't assume that you need much uh, definition. So we'll discuss about spectral properties. And also another notion I want to discuss in this course is this jointness this jointness of rescalings. This jointness of rescalings. And uh, this is about uh, comparing H, uh, it's a time change. Uh, H tilde of, oh, so, okay. It's about, uh, so what is a rescaling? is the time change uh, h tilde of t is the time change of the form h of kappa t. So it's a linear time change. Uh, tau is a linear map. So, uh, sorry, h tilde of f. For it's a homogeneous time change where everything is just rescaled by kappa. And uh, uh, this is linear time change somehow. And this is, again, a very trivial operation. I just rescale time. But again, in parabolic dynamics, it often gives uh, new systems. So it gives flow, which is not uh, isomorphic to the original one. OK, so now some, we have only a very few minutes. So for example, what I want to, uh, to prove, so we will, so some results maybe we want to discuss. So results. OK, so for, uh, so for uh, horocycle flow, so the horocycle flow standard on, we will discuss tomorrow on uh, uh, compact quotient of 
um, negative curve, co 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 constant negative curvature surface. So this is mixing. And it's actually mixing uh, in a very strong way, mixing of all orders, and uh, there are quantitative results, so estimates by Rattner, by Marina Rattner already. And also, we know a lot, we also know that the spectrum is uh, uh, um, continuous, it's actually a bad, but uh, so we want to discuss uh, time changes. And uh, again, for the time changes of the horocycle flow. So again, uh, mixing was actually known uh, uh, by Marcus, also it's a classical result. But we, there is a phenomenon which is mi mixing by a shearing. And this shearing is really a crucial mechanism in parabolic dynamics to explain both uh, mixing and the speed of mixing. And uh, okay, so this uh, mixing via shearing I want to uh, sketch tomorrow. And uh, if you look at time changes, you can also have quantitative estimates. But you cannot use the methods from the algebraic world. And uh, this we do in joint work with Giovanni Forni. And I'll sketch how you can make mixing quantitative when you use the shearing as an explanation for mixing. And uh, uh, I'll uh, quantitative. And uh, also, yeah, and also another thing is uh, Lebesgue spectrum. I will try to say something about how to use correlations and decay of correlation to study the spectrum of this operator. And again, so, so here it's something which was known, countable Lebesgue spectrum. And actually in this setting of time changes, it was a conjectured by uh, Katok and Tuveno. For many years it was open and we do, because again, uh, you cannot use the techniques from the homogeneous world, and we, we do it in this paper with Forney. And uh, another thing, which is, uh, so, so this will, will be an example of how uh, soft arguments, somehow it's what you need to attack uh, time changes. And uh, also of an important mechanism, this mixing via shearing, which we'll encounter Actually, again, and places of mixing via shearing is used in time changes of the horocycle flow, in time changes of nil flows, and in locally Hamiltonian flows. It's really ubiquitous to the examples we saw. So, try to sum up. And uh, uh, mixing via shearing, and then also another. An example of, maybe I'll mention this for the horror cycle, an example where the time changes are better than the flow itself, in this case, is from uh, this jointness of rescaling. Which is jointness of rescalings. Okay, this is anticipation of what we'll do later, a bit later. But somehow it's important, and I'll tell you tomorrow why, but it fails for horocycle. So all the rescalings of the horocycle flow are isomorphic to each other because of this algebraic nature. But it's true for time changes, true for non-trivial time changes. And this is a recent result uh, joined with Adam Kanigowski and uh, Marius Lemanchik and myself. And uh, uh, it's also proved differently at the same time by Flaminio and Forni. And in our case, it's based on shearing and uh, a disjointness criterion based on shearing. So maybe this, if I have time, I will do all right. We can see what we, how much we will do. But I want to mention it as an example where the time change is better than 
the original flow. Maybe that is as much as for time changes of the horror cycle. And then for time changes of need flows, of step at least two. So here I want to, so that here in this case, so we want to prove that uh, typic, some typical time changes and in some class, which unfortunately it's a, some kind of trigonometric polynomial class, but more restricted and smooth, but it's what we can do so far, uh, are mixing. And this is joint work with uh, Avila, Forni, Ravotti, and myself, generalizing earlier work with Avila and Forni for the Heisenberg new flow. So actually, maybe I'll tell you the Heisenberg case some form. Um, okay, and uh, this is again via shearing. I think I have to conclude in a minute or two. So again, it's a mixing via shearing. And again, this is an example where the system is only partially parabolic and mixing fails, but when you perturb, you can recover mixing. So these are some examples where the time changes play an important role. And uh, uh, okay, so as I said, uh, we will see mecha important mechanisms, parabolic mechanisms, Mechanisms, we, 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 as I already mentioned, mixing via shearing. And I already mentioned, uh, maybe I will say something about this Rattner property of shearing. And Something I wanted to mention is uh, renormalization, renormalizable parabolic flows. I didn't tell you anything today, but I hope to show you examples of these techniques in the, in the, in the course. And the plan is to start with horror cycle flow and time changes, then move to uh, uh, nil flows, and time change, maybe high minute flow and time changes. And then I want to show something also about uh, locally Hamiltonian flows, about uh, uh, Ratner property and uh, disjointness, say something. And uh, yeah, and in between, I don't know, I can discuss a bit if I want to, ah, sorry. Uh, there is a bit of flexibility because I don't know exactly how much, uh, how fast I go. And I certainly want to start with this. I could also explain, some basic toy model about deviations over Godic averages. Deviations over, if you are, and, but in all cases, I hope to start by giving definitions of every example and property that I use so that it can be followed independently without any background. And I will not give full proofs with all the details because there would not be time to do everything, but I try to give some sketch and some main ideas in some of the proofs of these results. That's the, the plan. But if you have special requests and if you want me to slow down more and do something more elementary or speed up and do something more technical, or if you want to see one result more than another, I'm very happy to adapt. So we have quite a bit of time and I'm happy to choose to do something more or less, and if it's one simpler or harder, I can adjust. So hopefully just today I gave you a big panorama of the type of yeah, results, objects and results in parabolic dynamics. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks for coming and for listening. <laughs>
I don't know if it's possible, but try to give me feedback so I can adjust. It would be helpful. Yes. I have a question. Yes. So, Renormalizable. Re that's yes. a word that occurs in one dimensional holomorphic dynamics. Ah, yes, it's this? related. If the question is it's related, it's related. Huh? Yes. So, so, uh, but I don't know how much we will see. So, it's more, so I think you see better the relation when you go to study linear flows on translation surfaces and take Muller dynamics. And, uh, but actually, um, uh, yeah, so renormalization vaguely is always the same idea. So, somehow you have a class of dynamical systems which have some kind of self similarity. And this is a typical feature in parabolic dynamics. Not everything, but many. So you can kind of zoom on some smaller scale and dilate the system and find the system in the same class. And uh, um, again, so the horror cycle flow is renormalizable in a very stupid way by the geodesic flow. Uh, mean flows are renormalizable in some sense. And, and linear flows on translation surfaces are renormalizable, so there is an operator. And in some sense, uh, in unimodal maps and all this theory, and you, mentioned, you also use some form of renormalization, but it's not exactly the same, and it's not exactly the science. It's the same spirit, but it's, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, actually, recently I started kind of investigating um, nonlinear uh, flows. So, Generalized interval exchange transformation. Actually, John Christoph Jokos started the whole program of studying generalized interval exchange transformation using um, red normalization tools. And this nonlinear theory has maybe more similarities with some of the techniques that are used in, but it's more in uh, uh, unimodal maps or maps with a critical point. And then there are complex methods there. And you, I don't know, maybe it's not what you had in mind. I think there is more theory with one dimensional dynamics kind of techniques of normalization. Yeah. Continue. Are there other questions? Yes. Yeah. I think we can stop for today. So tomorrow it's the same place at the same time. Yeah. Um, but on Friday it's in the morning. Yeah. Right. Okay for everybody. Okay. Thank you again.